OK. Go. Hello, I warmly welcome you. Uh, to, uh, mo moment, mo moment, moment. Just to be sure we are live. Uh, I cannot see it on my iPad. OK, OK. Okay. You can go. Go. Go ahead. Hello, I warmly welcome you. Uh, uh, moment, mo moment, moment. Just to be sure. Yeah. Hello, I warmly welcome you to our 10th webinar by the Academy of Space Renaissance International. And uh, I wish you all a happy new year 2022. Um, my name is Sabine Heinz, and I'm the person responsible uh, at the SRI for our webinar series. And on this uh, January 3rd, um, I'm delighted uh, that you have come to join us. And our today's topic is why space tourism is not just fun for rich people. And it's about the relevance of space tourism as cutting edge industrial sector, highly recommended, uh, highly committed uh, to develop technologies to transport and accommodate untrained uh, civilian in space. Um, a fundamental discussion to refute the common misinterpretation of space travel just as a very expensive uh, toy for rich people. And uh, our today's speaker is uh, Samuel Canigio, Kaniyu, uh, very welcome. Uh, it's nice to have you here. You have to unmute. Thank you very much. And uh, I also would like to introduce my co-host, uh, first of all, Bernard Foing, our president. Welcome and happy new year. It's nice to have you here. Yeah, happy new year. The 2022, it will be a great space year for many events, in particular for all astronauts astronauts from Spaceship Earth. And I'm very happy that today we are going to learn how citizens can go to space. Okay, uh, thank you, Bernard. And I also would like to welcome Adriano Ottino, our uh, former president and one of the founder of SRI and now vice president uh, in our society. Hello, Adriano. Hello, Sabine. Hello, Bernard. Hello, Sam and all the friends that we we'll take part to this uh, very important webinar. I'm very happy to have you here and to, uh, to wish uh, the best for 2002. Uh, that will be for sure a space year and uh, we hope it, it will be great and we will see the first steps of uh, civilians into space after the, the first civilians uh, tourists that uh, were that uh, uh, went to suborbit uh, to orbit in uh, in 2021. So um, I think the uh, space tourism uh, by now is a toy for rich person, but this is, is normal. Uh, rich person have toys, and normal people work and uh, earn a salary, and uh, and and this is a good thing, not not a bad thing, but. If we see space tourism in the perspective of uh, civilian space development, that is space settlement, then space tourism is the edge uh, activity, industrial activity. So uh, it depends from which uh, angle of view we are watching, we are seeing this, uh, uh, this thing that is space tourism. I, I, I think... Uh, uh, our friend Sam will give, give us uh, um, a lot of concepts and the reasons why we should uh, 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 sustain and, and uh, uh, yes, sustain space tourism and, and the uh, vanguard uh, companies that are, are developing it. Thank you, Adriano. Uh, and also, I would like to uh, thank you to the audience that they uh, join us today. We have people from Dublin watching, from California, and from Everyday Spacer. It's a name uh, he didn't put uh, from where he comes from. Samuel, uh, before I leave the stage to you, I would like to say a few words about you for our audience. 
Samuel Canillo is a futurist, writer, photographer, inventor, and private space um, in this industry advocate. Uh, he is board member and former vice president of the Space Tourism Society. Um, his research and uh, presentations have been covered by international media, <clears throat> including the Discovery Channel and Histori his History Channel. One of his more famous concepts, the Zero Gravity Cocktail Class Project, uh, Glass Project, won international acclaim and reinvents uh, the concept of how to drink liquids and uh, zero gravity environment. Um, his Cocktail making robots have been showcased uh, on the Discovery Channel and made the cover of the Wall Street Journal. He is busy writing a book on orbital design about reinventing creature comforts for off world travelers. Uh, Samuel uh, was active with the National Space Society, Space Rancher Foundation, and Yuri Snide. He helped the X-Prize team in running the historic flights of Spaceship One in 2004. In the 1990s, uh, he worked for McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing, on the Space Shuttle, um, the International Space Station, and the little known uh, but historic Delta Clipper experimental re reusable rocket program. Sam, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Sabine. Thank you. Um, I should I should make my uh, my bio much shorter so it's much easier to get through because um, yeah, I've just done a lot of stuff. One button, I thought maybe you won't insist. Um, it's insist okay. It's a longer version. Thank you. Thank you very much for the long introduction. And by the way, I should introduce the two people who just showed up in the Zoom call. Uh, John Spencer, who is the founder of the Space Tourism Society, and Robert, Robert Jacobson is a space venture capitalist who has done a lot of research and does investing in space projects and published a book called Space is Open for Business. But we'll talk about that later. Um, shall I start the presentation? Yes. The stage okay. is yours. Great. All right. Thank you. All right, do you see the screen? Yes. All right, all right. Do you see the, still see the screen, yes? Yes, yes. Everything is perfect. Good, good. Perfect, great. All right. So hello, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Uh, today, we're going to introduce you to the Space Tourism Society, give a brief introduction on space tourism, and answer some of the uh, common questions being asked about it. Excuse me, I have to figure out to get access to the controls. That would help. There we go. Uh, the Space Tourism Society is a nonprofit organization uh, that was founded in Los Angeles, California by John Spencer in 1995. He started doing space tourism work about a year before I did. Uh, John is a space architect and has done pioneering work with NASA, Hollywood, and the private space sector. His research has set the stage as to what space tourism will look like in the future. A little about me. Um, I'm a former vice president of STS uh, and currently on the board of directors. During my tenure, I created many design concepts and was a public speaker at conferences and during media events. Uh, besides STS, I've been also been involved with the XPRIZE Foundation, the Space Frontier Foundation, the National Space Society, and now Space Renaissance International. In the past, I've worked at McDonnell Douglas at the Kennedy Space Center. I worked on space shuttle and space station programs. Of note, I also worked on the Delta Clipper Experimental DCX project back in the 1990s. It was a precursor reusable rocket project that inspired both Blue Origin and SpaceX. On the side, I also worked with a team of people to develop the zero gravity cocktail glass and got really close to actually flying it into space. For fun, I developed several cocktail making robots that were hit at parties in Silicon Valley. Oh yeah, and I also go to Burning Man and participate in all sorts of creative desert adventures with uh, fellow artists. The space, at the Space Tourism Society, we design products and services 
that we envision would make life comfortable and fun for space tourists. And when I mean space tourists, I also mean earthbound tourists who want to get a flavor for living off world. By the way, we're having a conference. It's going to be live and in person in Los Angeles. It will be on April 28th, 2022 at the Renaissance Hotel LAX in Los Angeles. I assume there will be a strong Zoom and web presence so that the rest of the planet can attend. These conferences tend to be very eclectic. It is an amazing cross-industry gathering of folks in entertainment, architecture, aerospace, fashion, and more. Highly recommend if you can check it out. Part of our research uh, in the Space Tourism Society is includes studying the market. When you say space tourism, what does that mean? So we look at actual tourism research and found analogies in adventure travel. So like climbing Mount Everest or skydiving or uh, uh, aircraft, you know, fighter jet aircraft flying, things like that. So there's other analogies similar to that push the envelope because some people like to do more than just simply go to Disney World. They actually want to have training and be prepared to do more adventurous things. We also looked at how our culture views uh, space and space fiction. Technically, playing a space video game or entering a virtual world like the metaverse or Second Life or whatever they're calling it today could be considered a type of space tourism. This is the foundation of our pyramid at the bottom. The next level up will be considered more interactive. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are several immersive Mars habitats out there that you can participate in and pretend that you're actually working on a Mars space and doing science research. Uh, there's also museum exhibits and simply just going to a space center could be considered you know, the next level up on space tourism. After that, we have zero gravity flights. Zero G Corp has been flying for many years and there's some European and Russian equivalents out there to do the same services for doing parabolic flights. These flights can be both uh, for fun and also for doing science projects. Next level up. We have been waiting since 2004 after Spaceship One's historic flights for suborbital space travel to become a reality. Suddenly, in 2021, that reality has happened. The pinnacle of our pyramid is, of course, actual travel to space. Space Adventures is one of the oldest space tourism companies. They work directly with the Russian Space Agency to help prepare the adventurous billionaire for the extensive training for flying aboard a Russian rocket to the International Space Station. This service was postponed after 2009 due to the space shuttle retirement and an agreement with NASA to dedicate Soyuz flights for NASA astronauts. Also, suddenly in 2021, they're back in business. So let's briefly look at the industry growth. We had a lot of close calls in the early 2000s with the excitement around the Ansari X Prize. And then in 20, 2001, Dennis Tito, a Los Angeles business, businessman who successfully flew to the International Space Station. And after that, a whole succession of tourists flew up into the International Space Station until 2009. Meanwhile, interest in space has grown very strong with the general public. Thanks to the efforts of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, there's a lot of excitement around space travel again. Space travel simulation software, such as Kerbal Space Program, give people a flavor of traveling in space without while shooting from the computer. I should explain this chart a little bit more here. So at the bottom, we talk about simulated off-world tourism. and the upper part, we talk about real-world off-world tourism. Obviously, it's much easier to walk into a space center than it is to just hop on a rocket ship. So we see that the amount of people participating in simulations obviously is a lot easier and much more common than the real world off tourism. But as of 2021, you'll see in there on the chart, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Everything's going mainstream. Very few people remember that guest astronauts and cosmonauts have been flying to the International Space Station or the Russian space station Mia for many years. On this chart here, you'll see a whole list of guest astronauts and cosmonauts flying since 1984. I'm sorry I don't have all the Soviet era guest cosmonauts from earlier times, but this is a good starting point. And you'll see we have government sponsored, corporate sponsored and self-funded guest astronauts and cosmonauts who are up there either for fun or for 
political reasons or whatever. Um, I like to categorize two United States congressmen as space tourists over the far left, Jake Gard and Bill Nelson, because the only reason they really flew was because they were the heads of certain key funding committees for NASA. So you make those guys happy, NASA gets their funding. So magically, they got a seat. They went through the training, they learned how to fly. And one of them actually is the head of NASA now, ironically enough. Um, notably, in 1990 and 1991, a Japanese reporter named Toyohiro Akiyama and a British chemist named Helen, Helen Sharman flew on Russian rockets to the Mir space station, some of the earliest well-known space tourists. Start, and then, starting in 2001 with Dennis Tito, we had a multiple wealthy individuals fly to the International Space Station nearly every year. Quite an amazing growth. Then there was a pause. After the Space Shuttle Columbia accident in 2003, it was decided to phase out the space shuttle program by 2011. That left the United States relying completely upon the Russians for transportation to and from the International Space Station. Seats were dedicated to astronauts and cosmonauts doing science research. There were no more spare seats available for tourists or non-critical passengers. Then these guys came around. The general public does not realize that the companies that Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and Elon Musk created has spent 20 years trying to develop safe and reliable means of transportation for people. The general public only pays attention to them now because they actually have real flying vehicles. Rocket science is hard work and they have blown up a few rockets along the way. Thanks to them, space tourism is having a renaissance. Who could guess that in the middle of a pandemic in 2021 would become the year that space tourism would come of age? I had a hard time keeping track of all the flights and all the people going up on these flights. It was amazing. On this slide, you can see just the folks who did the suborbital flights with Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. By the way, you should check out William Shatner's comments after he landed on his flight with Blue Origin. He did not know what the overview, view, overview effect was, but he sure felt it. Also in 2021, there were several high profile orbital flights. This also includes the first multi-day tourist flight of the SpaceX Dragon, which flew higher than the International Space Station. Meanwhile, the first movie was filmed in orbit by a Russian director and actress for a Russian film. And in December, was wrapped up with the space tourism season with a wonderful flight by Yusaku Mayazawa. He brought up a friend as a cameraman to videotape his shenanigans in orbit. Yes, he looked like a classic tourist up there, but from my perspective, it was good research on how a regular person adapts to a very strange environment. Now on to answer some of the common questions I hear nowadays. These questions are for people listening in who are brand new to this space tourism concept. For my friends who are experts in space travel, bear with me as I cover the obvious. Number one question is, why the heck is space tourism so expensive? Duh, it's because it's really incredibly dangerous. It's not like hopping on an airplane and going to Chicago or New York. This is outer space. We just barely got made it to the moon in 1969, and we've been struggling ever since to build better transportation off-world. Don't want to go too much in the history lesson here, but due to politics and government bureaucracy, it has taken us 50 years to finally let private industry build rockets that are cheaper, safer, and more reliable. But what about, oh wait, let me go back a slide here. Uh, and even if you could go to the space right now, all that's up there is one research laboratory, not a hotel. It's like extreme camping up there. You have to go through extensive training, including physical fitness tests and learn lots of engineering and math. And oh, by the way, you got to learn some Russian so that you do not push the wrong button on the spacecraft and kill everyone. Got it? Here we go. Okay, the slide everybody was talking about. Ever since some celebrity billionaires started going into space, the general public started freaking out. Why are they spending all this money going to space instead of trying to fix planet Earth? 
I will not go into that debate because I only have a limited amount of time to talk and we will be arguing in circles for about 20 years. So here's my perspective. The new space movement has been going on for decades. You've just not been paying attention. These pioneers, especially folks at the Space Frontier Foundation, have been fighting hard to change government attitudes about private space ventures. They've been struggling to get funding to build new types of rockets and space stations. But for the longest time, investors would not take them seriously. NASA and the US federal government was the 800, the, the phrase is 800 pound gorilla, but they were the ones that prevented anyone from building their own vehicles. There was this attitude going on that only NASA can fly spacecraft and build spacecraft. And that's something we finally overcame, finally. With the emergence of these billionaire celebrities getting all this media attention, it has jump-started excitement in the new space industry. New funding programs such as SPACs, Special Purpose Acquisition Companies, have helped struggling space startups get a financial boost. All sorts of new industries, such as microsatellites and private space stations, are finally getting off the ground and revolutionizing how we see the world. All right. All right, when can I go? Let's see. Yes, okay. Space travel is expensive and dangerous. We've just begun going down the path of private industry supplying seats for visitors off world. Give it a few more decades, or maybe a decade, we'll see. I don't know. The prices will go down dramatically. As of today, there are only four options for flying into space. Space adventures via the Russians, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Virgin Galactic. Each one has different rates for their services. Suborbital flights are less expensive since they are only short, short joy, joy rides up and back. When you start seeing space travel flights happen on a monthly or weekly or even daily basis, heaven forbid, that's when the prices start dropping dramatically. So what's next? If you've been following the space news, there are several new space stations on the development. Some of them are being partially funded by NASA to eventually replace the ISS. Others are standalone, privately funded habitats. Several of the space stations are designed to be mixed use. That means that part of the facility can be used for research, part for a factory, part can be used for a hotel. Between you and me, I've been doing these presentations so long that I see a different round of space station proposals announced every few years and none of them have actually flown. So I'm not gonna hold my breath and guess which one will actually fly next year. By the way, I think Bigelow Aerospace wins the award for the longest running space station proposal that never flew except for a few prototypes in 2015 and the module attached to the ISS, their dream of building a standalone station for tourism could not be realized because there was no reliable transportation system to get people there. But then again, I'm an eternal optimist. Someday, one of these stations will fly. Thank you very much for your time. On this slide is contact information for me and the Space Tourism Society. Please don't forget that there's a conference on April 28th, 2022. And check on the links later on and learn more about us. Thank you very much. Oh, that was short. <laughs> I could have listened more longer. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, um, maybe your uh, colleagues want to add uh, something to your lecture, Robert or John? Are you here? You have to unmute and to, yeah. Hi, Robert. There's Robert. Very, hey, very Robert. Oh. Thanks, Sam. Sam's always, Sam manages to provide a really fun perspective on, on the kind of the human space experience, humanizing this. And I had just previously been on a call where there was a bit of a discussion regarding some of the points that Sam brought up regarding, um, you know, why are we doing this and the evil billionaires and this type of thing. And, 
and I and I sense that one thing for people to focus on is not necessarily it's not about not feeding the children or not addressing climate change. It's not an either or. These are not binary discussions. <clears throat> We can actually do both and all, and space is actually very complementary to how we can help solve many of our challenges. And then some people might say, well, then just use robots. You know, why send people up there? Well, do you still need humans up there to do very specific things in terms of research and activities where we've not been able to... Um, um, you know, we can't use robots to do some of the really fine tuning of, of like kind of the specific research type of thing. So even though some of these um, exploratory private missions might be tourism or recreational based, they're still going to, I think, open up the possibility for more, I think, um, other serious researchers and others to, to utilize this um, tremendous domain that's now being, um, you know, slowly emerging for the rest of us to be able to hopefully one day live, work, and play up there. And I'll let John, and great to see you, John. I see John there. Hey, John. John. Happy hey, Robert. Um, well, I agree with what Robert said, and thank you, Sam. You did a great job, as always. And Sam's one of those creative pioneers who has, from the early days, been thought, thinking about what we call space lifestyle. He actually coined that term, space lifestyle. Uh, and it really is going to be a space lifestyle. But also thank you for you guys for hosting Sam and for your Renaissance conference and all that. And it's pretty cool that our conference in uh, April is actually at the Renaissance Hotel. So I hope you guys can come to it. We'd love to relationship build with you guys and support what you're doing and all those things. I can add one area to what Sam was saying, which is evolving surprisingly quickly. It's an area what I call uh, orbital super yachting. Basically the idea is to model orbital vehicles after ocean going super yachts. And I've been working on that for about a decade. And it turns out that this is gonna be a big thrust forward because the most powerful people and corporations in the world own super yachts and mega yachts. And uh, the next thing for them is space. So we feel that merging what exists as a space yacht, but what exists as an ocean going yachting industry and culture, it's a major culture, uh, with space, that kind of merging together is going to give us a whole huge amount of resources and uh, people involved in what's going on. And also, as an outer space architect, it's fun designing orbital super yachts. And fun is an important part of the creative process. So that's a whole frontier that we're opening up uh, orbital and uh, sports yachting uh, over the next decade or so. But good job, Sam. And um, glad you guys are doing this. Thanks, John. Thanks for being here. And thank you, Robert. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's kind of pre that has preoccupied space people in the industry for so long has been about the rockets and the science and the physics and all this logical stuff. And that's fine. But what about the human side of living, working and playing in space? Heaven forbid that we play and have fun off world. I mean, the astronauts do that. The cosmos play around. They do. Uh, but, you know, there's more to life than just simply trying to make sure that this vegetable grows or these chemicals mix or they're doing some type of fusion or something like that. There is more to space adventures than that. We're all human beings. We have feelings. We have emotions. We have needs. We have issues. We have conversations. Uh, and so we need to figure out how to learn how to adapt our you know, not adapt people to the environment, but adapt the environment to the people. And that's the phrase I've been using lately. So can we create a space habitat, a hotel or a super yacht or cruise ship, that's no analogy we use, an orbital cruise ship that is designed for people who are, well, not rocket scientists, not astronauts, not someone who's taken 20 years of research and has military training and is like super specialized in these areas, but us, you and me, regular people who want to enjoy the experience of going up, coming back, and maybe some of us who stay up there because we work there. <clears throat> Think about that. Someone's got to make the food. Someone's got to maintain the equipment. Someone has to drive the ship. They're the ones that are going to be up there a long time. And so we have to protect those people and make sure they can stay alive because of radiation issues and yeah, micrometeorites and, and the effects zero gravity does to the human body and all these different effects. 
And oh, by the way, can we make it a little bit more comfortable? Because right now it's, it's only a few steps away from a survival camping trip. And I've done a lot of those. And when you're camping in a desert environment where there's dust storms and high temperatures and winds and everything's trying to kill you, it's fun for a little while, but after a while it gets old. And it's like, I want to have a nice cup of coffee. How do I have that cup of coffee? How do I sleep comfortably? How can I take a break without worrying that something's going to fall apart, something's going to break, something's going to blow up? If someone bumps into a button, is that going to set off the alarms and things blow up? Um, years ago, uh, I was at the space conference, and then some of the engineers sat together, we're having a beer, and we're joking about, well, how long would it take for maybe a, a, a five year old, a 10 year old child to destroy the International Space Station? And they just kind of like pretended they were drawing on a napkin. They said, oh, about 20 minutes. And yeah, that's about right. So why should the environment be so delicate and so sensitive to bumps and accidents and, and everything all over the place? And it, you have to be very careful what you do because crisis may happen. We need to find a way to design the entire environment, not only the way you work, you live, the whole habitat, the lifestyle, the colors, the smells, the ventilation, all these little things, we need to design it for people and humanize the environment, simplify, simplify, simplify the whole living, working environment so we can enjoy living up there. Very, very interesting. Wow. Um... I would like to mention uh, the people uh, or the audience in the chat. Um, we have uh, people watching from um, Pakistan, from Florida, from uh, Italy. And uh, I also have a question from Michael Basco. Um, uh, he's asking how big is the market, uh, space and uh, suborbital flights, uh, thousands of people assuming current uh, ticket prices? Uh, hi, Misha. How you doing? Uh, I, I know M Mikhail Basco from way back. Uh, I, yeah. What is the market size? Well, what is it today, uh, Robert and John? It changes all the time. I keep hearing different numbers. Put it at globally around 420-ish billion US dollars. And there's, you know, give or take, 20 to 30 billion. And that, that's, that's global, including, you know, um, government and private And it's, you know, there, and there's figures expecting it to grow to, you know, a trillion within, I expect to grow within trillion by the dec by the decade's end. Yeah, I agree with Robert on that. There's a lot going on you don't hear about, and major corporations and even new countries are getting involved in the space arena. There's a couple other things just to add what Sam was saying. Uh, the media industry is growing very interested Uh, in space tourism, space exploration stories again. Uh, there are two major competitions in the works. One's called Space Hero. The other one is called uh, Do You Want to Be an Astronaut by Discovery. And whoever wins these competitions, they're actually going to fly to the International Space Station. So that opens us up to a worldwide competition for people who don't have to be rocket scientists, but go through all these challenges and the winner gets to fly Uh, to the space station. Of course, that's be, be filmed and all that. Sports industry is now seriously paying attention to what could happen in space. Everything from skydiving, which has been done from the edge of space to lunar buggy racing on the moon to eventually America's Cup super yacht racing around the moon close to the surface. The, the whole point in what you guys say renaissance is true. It is a renaissance of creative ideas and science And the financial community is supporting it more and more every year. So this is a great time to get involved in the space arena. Yeah, I hope I will have the chance to go to the moon. Um, Bernard has also a question. Uh, <coughs> Bernard? Yeah, uh, so really I enjoyed the, the very compact uh, uh, presentation and uh, your view, the human perspective. So I've been myself working okay, 40 years in the space business. I've launched a number of my babies to space. Only robots, huh? so to the moon and Mars. And um, I agree with your human perspective. Um, however, uh, what uh, are we going to do step by step? Because a luxury hotel, uh, this is uh, not, uh, we are not yet uh, there. And 
uh, what we have done for this with the, with the human Mars platform, which I have developed in the last 15 years, is to provide, for instance, uh, simulation facilities like the one we have in Hawaii with Anchorages. We use uh, Utah. We built one in uh, Europe. And actually there, we are not dreaming of luxury hotel because we think that it's also part of the experience to see how we can live in the extreme. And uh, there, we say safety first, this we have in common. We want to do research because research also is a dimension that we, where we explore humanity. You learn the science of space, the technology of space, the human factor research. And I think uh, uh, I love to be a tourist, but I'm a tourist that like to know what I'm visiting, I want to see the culture and so on. So I think that there is a way where we can move beyond tourism, beyond science, beyond technology, where we put them you know, uh, together. So the tourists will learn about space and uh, the scientists also will learn about these human factors. So uh, how would you see the next step to implement before we have a full-fledged, super comfortable, uh, a space Renaissance Hotel in space. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bernard. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, many people want to do more than just simply look out a window in space. They want to do things. And more than likely, the first, I'd say for the first 20 years or so of space tourism, it will be like that. You will have participant guest astronauts who will you know, have some time off to play, and then they'll have other time to do things. And I know of many people who like to do vacations where they have a working vacation, where they're either working the land or they're doing a project or getting involved. So yes, there will still be science projects and this will be very educational for the, the, the participant, uh, whether they are doing a, a chemistry project or a biology project, they'll help the other scientists or maybe it'll be a standalone project just for them as well as these other activities. So when, you talk about tourism, that term is very general. And if you look in the realms of things like adventure tourism or science tourism, or there's, and John, John, John and, and Robert can give you like a whole list of different types of tourism that we have today on earth in the world. Um, a lot of which is actually tourism that includes work. It mm -hmm. includes some type of science activity or physical activity. We're involved with some type of a project as well as enjoying a few moments out there seeing the universe. So it's definitely going to be a combination of those two. And it may not really be until we have true space hotels in orbit that there'll be just pure tourists who are just vacationing and wearing a Hawaiian shirt and drinking a fancy drink and just doing that. That's going to take a while. But for now, there will definitely be tourists who want to work. Hmm. The space, the space, the space, agri yeah, the space yeah. agri tourism. Uh, Adriano, just finishing on this, we have a moon base in Hawaii, so it's a difficult place, but we always start with the I want shirt on the coast and enjoy the nature before we go for work. So you can always combine. Thank you, sorry. No, oh, I'm sorry, I was saying this. I don't know if this is only an Italian phenomenon or it is uh, uh, some, somewhere similar in the world, but in Italy we have some uh, a thing called agriturismo, agri agriturism, that is people going to a farm, a small farm, and they pay and they stay there and they work in, in, the, in the agriculture, in the... In the uh, with the animals and uh, this kind of things, so uh, I think we are thinking we are thinking about a similar concept for 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 space tourism, space agritourism, maybe. <laughs> oh yes, I, I totally agree. This is actually very common throughout the world. I mean, just taking your children to a farm to experience what's it like to working on a farm, and sometimes they're just simply looking at the animals, and other times they're given the opportunity to actually milk the cow or feed the pigs, or uh, pick the eggs from the chickens. So people like to participate. And mm -hmm. on, with farming, there's different levels of participation from just simply observing to actually getting the eggs from the hens. There's different levels that you can do. And so for space tourism right now, it's definitely gonna be more of a working vacation, I guess you could say, where you have to do a lot of training and preparation to get there, primarily because safety. Uh, it's extremely dangerous. The spacecraft that's flying right now, 
Um, it's, it's, well, we have, well, we have two types. We have the old school technology from the 1960s, like the shuttle and the, 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 the Soyuz rockets were from the 1960s era. Actually, the shuttle doesn't fly anymore. Um, and then you have the new generation, such as what SpaceX is doing. And then hopefully Starship, when that starts flying, which is basically a luxury spacecraft in comparison to the Apollo rockets, amazing things. Um, we have learned a lot over the years and we're just now able to start flying these vehicles and we've just begun to learn what we can do with them. <clears throat> you haven't mentioned uh, the Chinese uh, progress and, and space tourism part. Uh, they also want to uh, build a space habitat in the next years and uh, maybe this is also for tourism and um, I think they also want to uh, build up a space hotel Berna, I'm right or yes they want yeah, to construct the Chinese station and will be used for research uh, for inspiration of the Chinese people and for space diplomacy because they are inviting the whole world to contribute and uh, so And they are also now, now looking at the International Lunar Research Station. So clearly, they, it's a great tool to develop technology and to address one of their challenges. They, they want to uh, train creative minds for the future. They say, we want one million more engineers. And they can inspire them by this project of the space station. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, you're correct. Uh, my apologies for not mentioning uh, what's going on in China and in India as well when it comes to space travel mm -hmm. and, and, and space station. Um, I mainly focused on the United States because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, the Chinese space station is very interesting, but because of geopolitical situations, unfortunately, the Chinese cannot participate on the International Space Station. So the Chinese decide, well, we're going to build our own. And so the Chinese went off and did their own space project and their own space program, basically copying a lot of what we've been doing and also what the Russians have been doing. The Russians are advisors to them. In fact, they're using Russian variants of their vehicles to fly, um, which is fine. Um, I'm not really sure what's going to happen with the Chinese and their space station, whether it's going to be purely for science or if they're going to open up to a hotel. Maybe I've not heard any information on that. Um, it would be nice. Uh, but the big issue, as I mentioned on one of the final slides, was multiple private space stations are needed to be in orbit. And those space stations can have any purpose. It could be a factory. It could be a hotel. It could be a research park. It could be many things or all of them. It all depends on what they want to do. Axiom Space is moving very quickly. Uh, the company is, was funded by several astronauts and previous uh, 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 aerospace people who have lots of connections with the space station program. So more than likely, they're going to fly real soon with, you know, they're actually going to fly an astronaut crew next year, I believe. And then they're going to have a, you know, if they're building their, their vehicle, that they want to attach to the space station, which will eventually separate and become its own standalone space station. So I have high hopes for the group for, for flying first but we'll see. Um, as for China and for India and those folks, they're trying to be independent and, and do their own thing first. And I congratulate them for that, but they have run into the same challenges that we've run into. It's difficult. It is dangerous. Escaping the atmosphere, really hard to do, but they've done it and they're working, they're getting better every year. Oh, I hope There's another player, which is the Russians are thinking of independent uh, space stations and all that. And they're the ones who've flown the majority of, in fact, almost all of the space tourists uh, to the ISS. Well, actually they've flown all the space tourists to the ISS. Uh, the next big thing though, and I don't know if you're gonna go there, Sam, but uh, in 2023, there could be a Starship lunar flyby. And uh, in, that's all privately uh, financed. In my opinion, that's the next step of a big evolution where the space experience industry is a lunar flyby by private enterprise and we'll see an earth rise for the first time in about 50 years. Pretty cool. Um, I Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, Michael, just a second, Adriano. Uh, Michael has an interesting question. Uh, what matters me too is uh, how bad is a space debris uh, situation uh, with the Russians blowing up satellites and recent Starlink? Uh, Chinese station close all. Uh, will this scare the tourists and uh, will shrink the market? 
This is a really interesting question. So it matters me too, the space debris. Uh, maybe we could make, uh, instead uh, of uh, farming, we could collect space debris. Uh, it would be a new model, a business model. What do you say? To uh, yes. Uh, well, 2021 was a very interesting year. The space station had to maneuver out of the way of several pieces of space debris. So you're absolutely right. It is very dangerous. And now with private, uh, more and more private space satellites being flown, smaller ones even, um, the chance of collision gets higher. And the chance of this debris uh, uh, getting out of control or we miss one and suddenly it hits a space, a space station or a uh, satellite is very high. And it will get higher over the years. Um, there have been several groups who have proposed uh, garbage space space debris uh, management over the years, including like attaching tethers to satellites so they will like 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 uh, re-enter the atmosphere better, uh, more quickly. Um, even you know classic you know garbage truck type vehicles that can just capture the <laughs> the debris and just get them all together. Um, there, this is going to be a very important issue in the next few years, especially with what's going on with all the private uh, uh, small spacecraft that are flying up there, and then. You know, with the small satellites, the difference between the, the big satellites and the small satellites is that the big satellites are, are a lot more expensive and are designed to be very rugged and designed for last for many years. Whereas the small satellites, um, a couple could fail and it's not a problem. The company can still do their business. But what do you do with the failed satellites? They're still in orbit. They're still sitting there. How do you account for them? How do you pick them up? How do you either repair them, replace them, remove them? We don't know. We don't have a consistent system for that. Um, and there, in fact, there was a new company announced this past year. I think it was like Space. Uh, what was the name of the company, John? It just was announced. It was uh, Steve Wozniak's. Actually, Robert, you might know it. Steve Wozniak's uh, announced a company. They wanted to do research on, on space debris and possibly start collecting them and stuff. So, um, And, uh, you know, there, there's opportunities for that. Maybe you can make money doing it. More than likely, <clears throat> I'm predicting it's going to be like a SpaceX subsidiary. More than likely, uh, because of all the work that SpaceX is doing up there, and they have the most reliable vehicles, I suspect that a new company might get formed uh, off of SpaceX or a new division of SpaceX will be created that will manage garbage in space and debris in space. And there are several different ways of doing it. Um, and yes, that's that's going to be one of many pieces. And, I, my presentation could have been another hour longer and I could have talked about orbital infrastructure because that's another big issue is where are the gas stations in space? Where are the truck stops in space? Uh, where is this thing called the internet, interplanetary internet invented by a guy named Vince Cerf? Uh, I could have done a whole long discussion about that. The orbital that infrastructure, that is it's not tourism. It's industrial that industry. industry. Yeah. Thus, I kept my presentation short to focus on the tourism side. But when you talk about space debris, you're getting beyond tourism, you're getting into the realm of actually managing living in space and working in space on a regular basis, infrastructure, industry, that needs to be dealt with. Maybe I should have said uh, that you talk one and a half hour because- I think I have a question. I think yeah. I have a question. Adriano, you have a question, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, since you are in the, in the, in the United States, I would like to know what is your perception of this uh, uh, problem that the FAA uh, delayed another two months the uh, orbital test of a, of a Starship. And if we, if we add them to the, the other three or four months, it, it is now six months uh, uh, delay in what it could have been. Uh, I, I, I mean, Starship could be, could have, had its orbital test uh, some months ago. So is that is that a problem? Is there is there such a big discussion with the environmentalists uh, from and, and is it really dangerous the site where where the starship are, are taking off for the for the, the surround or is it a political tentative to to relent uh, 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 SpaceX in, in its uh, development? But, uh, I know it's, it's a complicated question. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it. Um, well, 
You remember in my presentation, I said that, uh, you know, people are complaining about these evil billionaires in space and that we should put all this money towards saving the environment. Well, part of the reason that there are those delays with those environmental studies is that if that rocket takes off and blows up, there are several communities nearby that could be affected by the debris. There's a reason that launch sites are typically on the coastlines because if they blow up, they're blowing up in the ocean far away from, from locations. The particular spot where SpaceX is at, there are some towns nearby, so we kind of have to be worried about that. And yes, there are environmental factors related to you know nature and stuff like that. And you have to deal with, you know, it could be debris that hits the ground, it could be fumes, it could be fire, it could be chemical waste. Um, those are valid. Um, and yeah, there might be a little politics going on because I'm sure people are, you know, just want to like give Elon some trouble. Um, it's all of those factors and more. I cannot say there's only one thing. And yeah, pretty much in the United States, there are laws in place. They have to do environmental studies. When you do any type of construction, any type of building, you have to, you know, check the environment. Is there like some endangered species nearby? Is there a potential threat to the neighboring towns and stuff like that? So it's good to be safe and kind of at least, you know, check the area out and make sure that we have a nice safety zone that's big enough to handle if there's an explosion or debris falling or some crisis. So I wouldn't be too cynical about it and have conspiracy theories. I think it's, it's a combination of, you know, they really want to play it safe because they're the government and their job is to protect people. That's their job. Well, it, it was um, not a good choice. The yeah. place... Elon Musk didn't make a good choice for the place where to 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 launch. Uh, the, 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 is not not the best uh, choice possi possible choice. I think is, is that so. Um, if FAA, he moved further FAA south, FAA is not wrong. Well, he could have moved a few miles to the south to Mexico and <laughs> probably flown as much as he wanted. So Mexico probably doesn't have as many uh, environmental regulations as 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 Texas does but the workforce is in the United States. Mm -hmm. So you have to find a compromise, a balance between location versus resources. Yes, SpaceX has also bought some uh, ocean going self propelled oil rigs that they're modifying, actually connecting together. So they can actually launch from uh, the ocean and probably around the uh, equator, uh, the big starship full scale. So they've been thinking ahead in terms of actually operations from the oceans. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other questions? Any other questions? Bona? You have to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, yes I have uh, some follow-up uh, questions. So from the point of view of our space renaissance or our space tourism society uh, community. So how can we uh, be involved actively in, for instance, in some of the lower part of the pyramid, like uh, uh, preparing uh, simulations or uh, uh, having access to a parabolic flight or suborbital flight? And I was looking also at ways where we could democratize more suborbital flights. But I mean, the idea of a lottery, it's not really so democratic, but at the end, only a, a few are going, but having a tool where uh, we can use suborbital flight as part of a, uh, research opportunities in universities. Uh, no, I did my PhD on the suborbital flight with a sounding rocket. And I think we could now uh, use that as an opportunity to have a, a PhD sent to space uh, with the PhD students this time. So um, did you also look at these opportunities where this could uh, attract as well some funding opportunities for young professionals to develop research on suborbital flight? Well, I believe John has mentioned there's a couple of entertainment companies that are planning, developing television shows and media events where they would uh, uh, select and choose some potential flight participants and go through some training and go through a whole process to learn where they can, how they can fly. So uh, if you combine entertainment with science, I think you'll have a much better path towards getting funding. 
Um, as, as we've learned with, with Hollywood, it's much easier if you do a marketing campaign, you can get people excited. And, and as you've noticed with the, the three billionaires in question that we talk about all the time, um, media and marketing does wonders for getting attention. So mm -hmm. if you want more funding for these projects, do a TV show, do a podcast, do a blog, write a book. Oh, got, got to push uh, uh, Robert's book. Robert's. Space is open for business. His book is right there. Um, it's a good introduction to the industry for those who don't know much about the space industry and how it works. So I'm pushing Robert's book right there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I so like to talk about uh, attracting attention because eventually you can also attract attention of non-space companies. So they can buy tickets for their employees to fly and do uh, something valuable for the company. So that we broaden uh, beyond uh, the, the world of media, uh, entertainment, and pure research. So I wonder how we can explore also this to involve uh, non-space company to become involved in uh, suborbital flights. Well, uh, that's happening right now with, uh, now that NASA is opening up the doors for more private commercial space activities, uh, there are companies like NanoRacks, that uh, uh, facilitate a lot of the bureaucracy and paperwork to get to space. So there are companies out there that help you right now bring your stuff into space. And also now, uh, non, well, for example, uh, uh, Tide, the, the laundry detergent, the company that makes it is it Procter & Gamble, I think it is, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, they have just launched into space on, on a recent uh, Dragon Supply flight, uh, tied uh, pens and other bleach pens to, to see if they can clean clothing off world. So it's an example of a non-space company getting involved in space that could benefit the astronauts. And one of the things I'm writing about in my book is about how to make, make life comfortable in space, including laundry, which by the way, you cannot wash clothes in space. But guess what? You have experts on Earth that know how to do laundry. Let's team up with them and NASA or space experts to develop a laundry system that works off world. Because right now, the astronauts wear their clothes for up to 30 days max, and then they throw them away. They put them on a cargo shuttle and it burns up in the atmosphere. So there are lots and lots of opportunities for non-space companies to get involved with space and their services will be extremely helpful. A quick little note, uh, the Disney Corporation has been involved in space since the late 50s in television shows and promoting attractions at their theme parks. And a few months ago, just opened a space themed restaurant at Epcot Center called 20, Space 2020. So the 2020 comes, it's supposed to be 220 miles above Earth is where they're space station is and the resort is, I mean, the uh, restaurant is. And there's, there's proposals, one of mine, for a $2 billion Mars future themed entertainment project called Mars World for Las Vegas and uh, Orlando. So Sam's exactly right. There are a lot of companies who are not traditional space companies, but are engaging in space to learn their way through this emerging industry and to bring their talents and ideas to the forefront whether it's products or restaurants or theme parks or movies and TV, to be part of this growing community. And as you all know, and you're all part of it, it's a great community. Okay. So we spent the resource, we want to join Mars World. Yeah, if you can do something uh, with you, uh, for you, yeah, we are ready. We have also a good community, very motivated for that. Um, Laura Fossick uh, is saying to you, Bernard, Southwest Research Institute and International Institute of Astro Astronautical Sciences are both sponsoring uh, suborbital flights for researchers. Oh, yeah, we have work. Alan Stern, mm -hmm. our good friend that is going to fly. Yes. And uh, Sam, for you, uh, Mikhail is saying um, that he personally thinks uh, that space tourism will perform a very important task by using those rich people huge uh, to cross out an item in their bucket list. It will direct tons of money into space and industry, and we will be better prepared for an alternate, alternative uh, ending of the don't look up story. 
And another mm. comment from him is, uh, one possible uh, scenario, IT will improve so much the YR flights to space um, and it may become as realistic as a real thing, similar to Zoom boom and pandemic. So, yeah. Um, I think um, we uh, have uh, clarified all questions. I thank you so much, uh, Sam, Robert, and uh, John to, uh, for joining us, for present presenting uh, us uh, the topic. And uh, it was really very, very interesting. And uh, I would like uh, to have a face-to-face -face conference where we can talk uh, about this because uh, it's really, really very interesting. And uh, if you have a flight for free, um, I'm here. So <laughs> I would like to go into space, but I'm not rich. Um, <clears throat> thank you to Bernard and Adriano and to the audience for joining us. And our next web webinar will be uh, in two weeks uh, on Monday. Um, I would like to see you and um, to welcome you, and I wish you a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.